When did you first meet my father? Um, 1970. There was a job interview. And he very timidly, I know that's not what you think of, but very, very timidly said, have you by any chance seen my paper on quantum mechanics? Mm, that and day. That day, yeah. yeah. And I said, oh my God, you're that Hugh Everett. Because I had seen it and thought it was the work of a raving lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> and told him. It, you said that? It's all, and he thought it was very funny. And so we, we knew we could enjoy each other. Wow. Even though he was of constant physical presence, I, he's really a complete mystery as a, as a person to me. What was he like? You know, that's, that's what I don't really know. Um, he was peculiar and a bit eccentric. He was a very good friend to me in his way. Yeah, I will show you something. That friendship and contrast. You have here... Wow, he's outside. Yeah, this would have been late 70s. That's basically what he was wearing every day and every night at the dining room table as well. Yeah. He, that, that was his uniform. The only thing you guys have in common is facial hair. Yeah. And otherwise, you look like a completely different, you know, it's like Species. city guy and mountain guy. And yet we were really good friends. Don is an expert in quantum mechanics and starts Mark off nice and easy on his quest to understand his father's theory. All you need is a pencil. If I take a pencil and I cut it in half and cut it in half and cut it in half and just get ever, ever smaller pieces, at some point I may run out of something I can cut in half. You've gotten to the point where the pencil no longer can be subdivided. You've right. come to something that's no longer bits of a pencil, but is something more fundamental. Right. And that was the notion of an atom. Atoms are the building blocks of the universe, microscopic particles that make up everything we see around us, from houses and guitars to rock musicians. They're so small that there are more atoms in a full stop than all the pencils in the world. If you could somehow look inside one of these atoms, you might see what it's made of. In the middle is a concentrated ball of material called the nucleus. Around the nucleus are tiny particles called electrons. These electrons spin super quick around the nucleus. Now, this is the crazy bit. The classical laws of physics seem to work fine for everything much bigger than an atom. For instance, Newton's gravity makes apples go down rather than up. At an intuitive level, these classical laws make perfect sense. But the classical laws all break down when it comes to really tiny stuff like atoms. The electrons don't fly around the nucleus in nice regular orbits like planets around the sun, but instead they are smeared out around the nucleus taking on a cloud-like form. What's that flaming ball in the sky? And even weirder still, they are everywhere at once. Welcome to the quantum world. What do you think about this? You know, my father, clearly on the top of his game with the mathematics and whatnot, and uh, I, the farthest I got was I flunked out of uh, the easiest ninth grade algebra mm -hmm. class. I just couldn't grasp it. Right. I just don't. I just didn't inherit that gene. Yeah. Um, I thought a lot about that. About how stupid I was in math. Um, I think I'd have phrased it differently. Did maybe my father spoke spoke of it? No, no, no. I'm. I what mean, a disappointment I was. <laughs> no, I think if your father had had the emotional vocabulary, he'd have been very, very pleased with what you did with your music. Bon Jovi looking at his life in a rock band sucks, man. On a steel horse I ride, wanted, dead or alive. 
you ever wanted to win a place at Princeton University to study for a PhD and be close to his hero, Einstein. A glowing reference from Hugh's undergraduate professor confirms that he was already a budding genius. He says, this is a once in a lifetime recommendation for I think it most unlikely that I shall ever again encounter a student I can give such complete and unreserved support. And yeah, that sounds like a ringing endorsement. Hugh arrived at Princeton in 1953 at the age of 22. After a year studying maths, he was persuaded to switch to the far more glamorous quantum mechanics. The man who was the catalyst was Professor John Wheeler, his new mentor. Wheeler was keen on a particular experiment. It's called the double slit experiment, and physics professors love it because it's the perfect way to demonstrate the weird quantum behavior of tiny particles. I'm going to tell you what nature behaves like, and if you will simply admit that nature does behave like this, you will find her a delightful, entrancing thing. So that's the way to look at the lectures, not to try to understand. I think I can safely say that uh, nobody understands quantum mechanics. <laughs> Mark is going to be shown the double slit experiment by Yi Ma, a technician at Princeton's physics department. You want to see this experiment? I, yeah, lay it on me. Okay. See, okay. We, see if you can make me understand quantum physics. It's a challenge, but uh, <laughs> I accept it. Okay. <laughs> what we have here is a black box, but inside it's rather simple. Uh, here's a laser. Is this laser going to blow my eyes out or anything? No. Like <laughs> they are very... Uh, I went to a Who concert in seventh grade and the laser went right in my eyes and I've had to wear glasses ever since. I see. Usually we don't see the laser being in the air, so we have a way of showing it. You see that? Oh, there it is. There are many, many little particles uh, we call photons. Well, what's a photon? Photon is just a... Uh, uh, it's a... Uh, Good question. Um, you, don't I didn't you don't know what a photon is, do you? I didn't prepare for uh, this. is a hard question. Mm. When we say photons, we always give this mass and the unit and size of it because there's no common language you can use to describe it. Wow. What it is photon. And massless. So that's very difficult. Wow. So I'm sorry I asked. No, it's a good question. Very mm. good question. I need to put you on the spot. To oversimplify enormously, photons are tiny particles of light. Electrons and photons behave similarly, and both obey quantum laws. But because we can actually see photons as light, they're ideal for this experiment. From the laser apparatus, single photons fire off one at a time. The individual particles then arrive at a plastic barrier with two narrow slits. On the other side is a sensitive TV camera to film where the photons end up. And so the photons will hit the film. What do you expect? You expect we'll hit two spots here, like that, or you expect the photon will go all over the map. What do you expect? We have two slits here. The choices are all over the map or, or just those two just spots? just two spots, yeah. yeah. Uh, just the two spots? Exactly. Mark is using his common sense. Imagine this experiment was blown up to a much larger scale so that the particles are tennis balls. And a machine is firing the tennis balls at a barrier with two gaps in it. Of course, you'd expect to find the balls hitting the back wall in two places, in line with the two slits. But when our experiment is done with individual photons from the laser, something very different happens. OK. You see the uh, screen up there? Yep. That's what we see from the camera. See those individual flashes? Oh, yeah. yeah. Those are the photons. Each flash of light is actually an individual photon hitting the back wall. They appear to be landing all over the place. But watch over time and a pattern emerges. Can you see somewhere in the middle of the screen? Uh, it looks like a smudge. Yeah, it looks uh -huh. like a smudge. Yeah. Those are the photon where the photon hits. But it's not two, as we would expect. 
Is that weird? <laughs>